Good evening. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Scotland uh, ITP Support Association virtual meeting for September. Wow, it flies by. Um, just a change in our expert tonight. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Baggett had an accident last week. Oh, and no. And is suffering from some slight concussion. So she contacted oh. me yesterday and said, you know, she, you know, she doesn't feel too good. So um, I've asked Professor Adrian Newland to step in. And most of you will know Professor Newland. Yes. Yeah. And um, yes. so uh, he, he's, you know, one of the top guys in the world, to be perfectly honest. So Adrian will be here to answer Flat any questions. Flattering me again. <laughs> I have to. Oh. I have to. Um, as always, uh, this meeting will be recorded and I, I will aim to post it on our YouTube channel sometime tomorrow afternoon, hopefully. Um, okay. So other people who've registered but couldn't make it can actually watch the video. Um, we had about 20 odd registered for this one. So how many have we got? One. Got another one coming in now. Yeah. So one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So we're doing okay. We're doing okay. So yeah. right. Um I've got okay. one question, Adrian, that came via email, and it was um if I can find it, it was a lady who was at another meeting earlier in the week because We've also been having a few in-person meetings uh, recently, and we've got another couple next week. Um, and it was around about iron supplements. And I know this has been brought up many times, et cetera, but mm. is there mm. any truth in the thing, in, 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 in the, you know, what s some people are saying on the internet, that by taking too many iron supplements, that can lower your platelet count? No. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. I mean, it's 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 an interest. Iron supplementation is an interesting point in 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 ITP because obviously you don't we we don't absorb a lot of the iron we get in the diet because iron is a poison. So if you take too much, you can it can overwhelm your defences if you take it over a long period. And there's certain congenital conditions, something called hemochromatosis, which is the commonest inherited condition in in caucasians that in white people that that uh causes iron overload and over the years it causes severe problems but the body has very careful mechanisms that in general for diets you only absorb about 10 percent of the iron which is no more than a milligram a day and we normally lose that by shedding skin and things like that but of course women who have periods may lose that in pregnancy you can lose a lot of iron if you don't get supplements so if you have itp and bleed a little bit more you can become iron deficient quite easily mm -hmm. and if you become iron deficient to the degree that you become a bit anemic that can make bleeding worse mm -hmm. i guess because the blood's a little bit crudely to put blood blood's mm -hmm. a little bit thinner and doesn't clot as well so mm -hmm. it's very important if you've got itp that you take iron supplements if you have iron deficiency in the amounts that are prescribed not over an amount not not more than that because you want to keep your iron levels topped up so you don't want to add anything that may increase your tendency to bleed but iron deficiency itself won't put the platelet count up indeed interesting enough chronic bleeding can actually put the platelet count up itself because the body's so trying to compensate and stop you bleeding and the bone marrow produces more platelets so we occasionally see people who come in for an investigation of a high platelet count and actually what they're doing is bleeding very small amounts so they don't actually know they're bleeding very small amounts over a long period and the platelets go up so it's it's important to think about that it's it's quite a sort of complicated balance but it's it is an interesting point but m most people, I think, I don't know if any here have taken iron supplements, but a lot of them quite cause quite some can cause severe side effects. With a few head shake in there, so, yeah. so some have, yeah, causes wind and and gut ache pain and a bit of diarrhea and things mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. it's a question of finding the supplement that that suits you as an individual. Okay, thank you very much. I I, I must also introduce 
it was a uh, remiss of me at the start not to introduce Rhonda Anderson, one of our well, our senior patient uh, mentor, and who's a board member, and she always smiles when I say that. And Anthony Hurd, who's also one of our board members, and also good to see Sue Hussin, who's joined us. Sue has helped me uh, organise several meetings up in Edinburgh over the years. Welcome, Sue. So, any questions from anyone? Okay, Mad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> around about April, I went for my diabetic blood test and I got a call from 111 to go to a &E ASAP because my um, they said my platelets had dropped. So I got really scared and frightened. I never never knew I had ITP. I know my daughter has, but I didn't know about me. Anyway, when I went to a &E, um the hematologist um, came to see me and everything. Um, and because I was rushing and it's all of a sudden, my heartbeat went up and BP and everything. And uh, my platelets were 28. So they were monitoring for about three months now. And they're just around 28, 44, they go down up like that range. And mm -hmm. then they, uh, they put me on um, steroids. So I said, I'm diabetic. Uh, stairs will shoot my sugar up but they said don't worry because we need to bring your platelets up if you need to walk around steroids to bring the platelets up something like that but um my sugar started going up my blood pressure started going up with steroids uh so they put me on this um gilkazide i don't know how to say it glucoside yeah side yes yeah. That's the tablet against diabetes. It's one of the oral anti-hyperglycemic tablets. Mm, that's right. But um, because in the morning, the sugar is a bit low. Not low, but like some, around 7, 6, 7. Mm -hmm. And by midday, it after the when I had the stairs in the morning, it starts shooting up. Mm -hmm. And then evening, it sort of gradually goes a bit down. But I don't know how all this works, because if you're diabetic, can anybody give you steroids or is there any other options? Yeah, um, I no, I, I presume you weren't bleeding. And I wasn't bleeding, no, nothing. No, this was totally out of the blue because out of the blue, I didn't it, it was shock. Because I, I guess about a third of patients who are diagnosed with ITP are diagnosed like you, completely out of the blue. They have a blood test for something else and the platelets are are low. And so we don't know how what number in the population out there have got a low platelet count and just don't know about it because they don't have a problem and mm -hmm. the issue is do you actually need treatment and uh, most people would say if a platelet count is hovering around 30 a little bit below or a little bit above and you aren't bleeding then possibly it's worthwhile just monitoring it with a with instructions that if you develop bruises or those little patiki on the ankles, which you may have read about, that's the time to have a platelet count checked and have treatment if necessary. So just treating out of the blue with a platelet count of around 28, a lot of haematologists wouldn't do that, to be honest. Um, they'd want to monitor it. Um, and particularly as in general, the first line of treatment in, in ITP are steroids, and steroids are well known to put the blood sugar up, yeah. and which can make diabetes very complicated to manage, particularly for younger patients who have the what's called type 1 diabetes, which is where you need insulin. It can really disrupt control of that. Mm -hmm. It's in, in type 2 diabetes, which is what most older people uh tend to have, then it may mean adjusting the tablets they've done with you. But the issue is giving either minimal treatment so to put the platelet count up so it doesn't affect the blood sugar to the same degree or thinking about something else. And quite a lot of um, haematologists, if faced with a patient with diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes, the insulin-dependent diabetes, but also type 2, yeah. if they have to treat a patient, I, particularly if the platelet count falls below 20, and is associated with bruising and bleeding, we'll aim to start on something like l thrombopag or Remipsplastin or Avotrombopag, you know, one of the thrombopoietin drugs. Although they're more expensive, they are safer in the oh. diabetic. So the issue is, and I suspect 
if your blood sugar is causing problems, it is. You, you should ask your hematologist, I'm not bleeding. My platelet count has never been below 20. Do I actually need to have steroids? Can I stop it and see what happens to my platelet count? Okay. Can they can they just stop the plate, uh, um, the steroids or do, do they have to uh, wind it down slowly? It, what sort of dose are you on? Uh, at the mo they started with 30 and then 20, now I'm on 10, but it's still yes. my sugar like is, and with this, it's every, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, well, on 10, what they should probably do is then drop it down to five or seven and a half for a week or two weeks, five for a week or two weeks, and then stop. That's what I want, yeah. But I, I would feel, tell, you t telling us what your count was when they were just monitoring it, the need for treatment is pretty low. I mean, we always try and say to patients, don't worry too much about the count. Worry about the impact of the count on you. And if you're well and you're not bleeding, you probably don't need treatment. The only time, say, if you're running a count of 25, 28, 30, 40, that you may need treatments if you say wanted needed some major surgery. Okay. Um, because even dental treatment at the count of 40 is fine, but if you need any operation, then they want to see a count up of uh, probably above 50 or above 70, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. But mm -hmm. that that would be that would be an indication for treatment, not just saying, oh, your plate of count's low, I'm worried about it, because you weren't worried about it. It wasn't causing mm -hmm. you problems. So I would I would say to your hematologist, I think it would be a good idea if we continue to tail this off and we just follow the platelet count and see what happens. That's right. Okay, lovely. The thing is, because my daughter's got ITP and she's special needs with other issues and all, yes. and I'm looking after her. So with yes. medicines and all, I'm finding it very difficult, very difficult to juggle everything. Mm. Yes. Okay. Just, just, just a number of questions, questions Ed. Uh, will you be at Hammersmith next week? Nikki Cooper's meeting. Uh, is there a meeting? Yeah, we might be there. Yeah, you might be there. Okay, I'll, I'll see uh, see you there. Hopefully, then. Yeah, we can have a chat. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Rhonda. You got your hand up. Um, yes, yes. A couple of things. I'll take it down so it's not confusing. Um, a couple of things. First of all, the iron. Um, one of our um, experts, and I can't remember which lady it was. Sorry about that. Memory's not as good as it used to be. And it was a while ago. Um, was talking about a low ferritin level. And um, perhaps Adrian could comment on this. If you have um, below normal ferritin level mm. and you're having a lot of trouble with periods and things like that, then it might be um, worth looking into a, a tiredness, tiredness and various other things might be worth looking into taking the iron tablets, the ferritin tablets. Yeah. Um, but that would only be, you know, if you were under medical supervision to do that. But ferritin is one of the ways of measuring iron levels. Ferritin is essentially the iron store in the body. So you can actually measure iron itself. And they normally measure something called iron and the iron binding capacity in the blood. And that shows... The ratio of the two shows the iron levels are much lower than the ability of the blood to carry it around. But a true measure of the stores is 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 this serum ferritin. And most places now just measure a ferritin to see what the what the levels are. And uh, it's it's a whole different range from iron, but it's a good indication of the stores. And as Rhonda was saying, when you're short of iron, it can make you tired because you're anemic. And the body actually needs iron for other cells as well. Your muscles need 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 iron to work properly. So if you're iron deficient, your muscles ache when you move, and it can make you feel generally exhausted and tired. And as Anthony pointed out in the latest bulletin, and talking about fatigue and tiredness, uh, when someone with ITP complains of tiredness, we look for things like iron deficiency to exclude that and treat that. So we try and treat any of the things that we know can cause fatigue before being able to say, unfortunately, this is related to your ITP. Yeah. And the other point that I'd like to make is that sometimes if you do need an operation, even if your platelet count is low, I had a splenectomy when my platelet count was eight. Mm. Uh, not ideal. They wanted it to be 80. 
but it um, obstinately wouldn't go up. Mm. So I'd had lots of, um, I was in hospital and I'd had lots of steroids and all sorts of other things mm -hmm. and um, it just wouldn't rise. So they decided to remove my spleen. That was way back in the old days in 2000 and they don't necessarily do that kind of thing now because in the in the in the good old days uh, they didn't have the drugs that they've got these days. Mm. So you know you can have an operation if mm. your platelet count is low, but obviously it's not ideal, and surgeons do not like doing it. Surgeons would only do an operation with a platelet count at that level if they had no choice, mm. and of course. Once you take cl clamp the spleen, what, what, that, what, what that I mean is the little blood vessel that goes into the spleen, once they've put a clamp on that before they take it out, the platelet count will start to rise because the platelets are being destroyed in the spleen. Um, and they they do an operation at that level, knowing the platelet count will go up quickly. It may fall again a week later or a few days later, but it normally will go up. And they know that the blood will... Where, they'll stop bleeding normally in those circumstances again they'll have platelets ready to give you but in general no surgeon would operate on someone with a platelet count of eight if they if they, if it wasn't an emergency um but sometimes in patients with itp it's almost impossible to get the platelet count up at all and in the old days pre the 2000s so taking the spleen out was a common response to that. Although I must say, unlike Rhonda, who did very well, the vast majority of people don't, don't respond. And the number of spleens we take out now is tiny, absolutely tiny. I mean, we've taken probably about one or most two out in the last five years in our, in our hospital. I think the figure of um, response was about 65% uh, positive Mm. Um, response. That was the figure I was told anyway. So I did know that it might not work. And they did actually come and tell me that it hadn't worked after mm. a couple of days. Mm. Mm. Then fortunately, I, mean, I made a recovery. Yeah. I mean, interesting enough, patients who respond very well to steroids, although temporally, or who respond very well to intravenous immunoglobulin, may respond to, to splenectomy. If you don't respond to anything, the chance of responding to a splenectomy are probably no more than one in 10. And that's one of the reasons why many years ago we set up the test that some of you will be aware of, where we actually did what we call a splenic scan. You actually take platelets, you put a little radioactive label on them and you inject them back into the patient. If they all go into the spleen, we know that taking the spleen out will work. If they don't, if they're removed in the liver or the spleen or bizarrely in the lungs we know taking the spleen out is irrelevant and you don't have to put someone through a major operation for something that you know isn't going to work that will cause long-term problems because your platelet count's still low you no longer have a spleen you've got to take penicillin all those all those sorts of things so um we used to do a lot of them we don't anymore purely because we have so many more treatment choices now that we don't we don't have to resort to that. In the old days, when it was a was an issue of steroids, azathioprine, splenectomy, you, 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 there, there, there weren't many options. But uh, but it's very very unusual now to to take the spleens out. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Rhonda. Um, Ali, I see your the good point you made in the chat. Would you like me to read it out, or are you okay just explaining it? Yeah, I can briefly explain it. Yeah, uh, so, uh, hi, nice to meet everyone. Hi, hey, welcome, my friend. Welcome. Nice to meet you all. Uh, yeah, my question was about uh, switching from uh, not dexamethasone, ever trumpa bag to mm. end plate. Yeah. So I've asked online and, and a couple of other groups uh, the impact of that that switch on fatigue because I've noticed as soon as I started out ever trumpa bag. I've got uh, my fatigue just gotten worse. I don't know if that yeah. is related or not, but it, it kind of the timing, it seemed like it is related to that. I mean, it's it, that's almost an impossible question to answer, I'm afraid, Ali. Um, mainly because fatigue is a very individual thing for each person. But El Trombopag itself isn't necessarily associated with fatigue 
it's not something that we picked up um, in in the in the early studies, which are in the right. It was around two thousand and five when we did them. Now, when we treat a lot of patients, when we were looking at both the side effects and the clinical effect, it wasn't a regular association with with that. But every person is individual, and some people may react to a drug in a way that that others don't. So the proof of the pudding is a little bit in the eating, as, as they say, that if you as an individual have gone from one drug where you didn't have a problem to another drug where you develop a problem, the likelihood is it's relating to some impact of that second drug on you. And the question really is, what's the clinical effect of that drug? If if the, if you resp I assume that the swap was because um, you were failing to respond. Uh, no, it wasn't that. It was, in a way, my platelets were between 30s to 60s, but they were still happy with that. Yeah. But since switching to the M plate, yeah, they've been steady in the 130s. So yeah. I think the main argument from my side was I just wanted to try it to see if it would do anything yeah. for the fatigue. So the issues for you is that, that they will neither Eltromopag or N plate, which is remiplistin for those of you who, who know the different names, neither of those neither of those treatments are specifically associated with fatigue. And for you, Ali, it's a question of you've obviously responded to N plate. And actually you seem to respond quite well if you if your treatment's running at, at 130, we're very happy with that. I mean, normally we say if it's over 50, we 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 don't worry, but if if you feel in yourself much happier to be running a count where there is really no risk to you at all, um, because certainly any count over eighty, you you stop bleeding completely normally. I mean, heaven forbid you could be run over by a bus and you wouldn't have any more bleeding problems at that, at that level than, than 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 anything else. So it's a question: is if you can cope with the fatigue and it's not impeding your life, but you're happy with the count, then you can continue. If not, then you'd have to consider maybe another change going on to the other trombopag or, or, or something like that. What I would say is the once the body gets used to the change in drug, you may find the fatigue actually does damp down and improve. So it may be worth persevering with for a while longer and see how you get on. But that's obviously a personal thing. You're the person, you're the only judge who knows how severely it's affecting you and how it's impacting on your life. I'll try that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Ali. Uh, um, okay. can, hurry, One sorry, point. could I just say something about fatigue? Yeah. Um, right, I'm not, not you know, well up with fatigue, but I do know people who um, are being advised about it, and I don't know if you can look it up on the internet, but... People who have really severe fatigue and still need to function um, are now doing a thing which is called spoons. I don't know if you've heard of this, where yeah. you work about work out how many spoons of energy you've got a day and you allocate them to your different tasks. So you might say, I've got 10 a day and two of them will you know, take me to 10 o'clock in the morning once I've got out of bed and had my breakfast and got dressed and sat down and, and looked at my WhatsApp or whatever it is. And then you allocate it out. So when you run out of spoons, then you know that you've got to rest or you rest in between. So that is a way of sort of thinking about your fatigue in a way that you're feeling as though you're in charge and you're managing it. So it sounds like you know about that, Ali. Is that right? Yeah, that is, it's quite funny that you said that because I, I am an occupational therapist by background. So <laughs> I, I, I had to basically, which is what one of the difficult things of switching from patient to uh, from a therapist to patient. But yeah. uh, I think I've, I've started to do to do everything I preach, basically. Spoon theory is one of them. And that has contributed to my fatigue in a good way. So I, I'm feeling a lot better. So I don't know if that is from the switch or from the change of lifestyle and pacing. Mm. But it could be, yeah, it could be. It mostly is just from the change of. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's an interesting concept that, and it's in before spoon theory. What we used to say is, don't don't fight it, in that 
there's a great tendency to think if I if I, I can work through this, I can build up my energy levels by working. But actually, they can make you even more exhausted. That makes it then harder to perform. So you 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 perform to a certain level, which is a sort of using your two spoons up till ten o'clock or or whatever. So rather than fighting it, you you work with it and allocate a certain amount of energy to do certain things and say, okay, once I've done that, I'll maybe sit and have a cup of tea or or just a little rest for half an hour or if if your work allows you to do that. And I I guess like most occupational therapists, you worked off your feet because there aren't enough of you. Yes, unfortunately it is, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm lucky with work, like that I've had some reasonable adjustment in terms of being able to sit down and actually take that time to rest and then yeah. go back to yeah. it. Yeah, well, that's good. Joe. You're obviously you're up on that and sensible and understand. But I mean, the, the the point is, I mean, as I just reiterating the point I made earlier, it it can wear off and improve and just go away as your body habituates to the change in drug, and that's always worth persevering, because knowing that having this sort of confidence and the peace of mind of knowing you're now running platelet counts that are perfectly safe for one injection a week is quite a good psychologically quite a good thing and that's also helps as well once you sort of get used to the slightly different lifestyle of not adjusting your diet and and having to remember to take a tablet and things like that so so it it, it is a sort of balance and it's a personal thing as 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 i'm sure you you you're aware yeah mm -hmm. I think it's really important when you've got something like that that is impacting on your life so much that you feel as though you've got some kind of control. So a lot of people will write down, you know, how they feel, um, which is very, you know, considered by psychiatrists or, you know, psychologists, that it's very good to write down and express how you feel. Um, you won't, wouldn't show it to anybody else or, you know, whatever, but it's just so that you get it out there and you've got, you've got some feeling of control and also you prioritise exactly what you need to do. Of course, if you're a person who's working and you're expected to do certain tasks or get through a certain amount of work each day, then, you know, to be in control of it. You have to be able to say to your boss, well, you know, I can't actually do that much or now I'm feeling a bit better. I could do a bit more so that you're the one who's in control, because if you don't feel in control, it's a horrible feeling. So I think that little bit of control is really helpful mentally. OK, thank you. All. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Adrian. Right. Any more questions? Pat, we can just about see you. It'd be Pat and then Betty. So Pat first. You're on mute, Pat. No? Whilst we're waiting for Pat, we go to Betty. Betty? Okay. Done it. Oh, you done it. Uh, Betty, hold on. Pat's back. Go on, Pat. Um, yeah, Dr. Newland, um, I'm glad that you're on because <laughs> we've met. But um, I was taking IV, IG um, intravenously until lockdown. Yes. And after lockdown, I was put on Revelate. So that's about three years. And... Um, and it was, you know, about 80 or so. And mm. I remember the hematologist said, well, that's a good reading. Um, best not to let it go above 100. But anyway, one day, for some unknown reason, it went all the way up to 364. Well, the hematologist said, oh, that's normal. But I tried to tell him that I've suddenly developed these terrible, terrible muscle pains. Mm. And at night, they're extremely excruciating. Um, so I had a, another doctor in the end take me off. Yeah. And that's been good because gradually by um, the end of July, I was able to sleep and didn't have excruciating pains. Yeah. So it was the medicine. Now, the strange thing is, even though I've been off the medicine a few weeks, 
I still got, um, it's up to 155, 106, and then it went up to 177. So yeah. it's interesting, it's going up, and I'm not on any medicine. I dare yeah. take anything. Yeah, I mean, that's that's very interesting because we reckoned, and we saw this first with, with N-plate, and it's also been shown with Revelade as well, that if you're on a drug for a length of time, a significant portion of people, maybe at least a third, can stop the drug and the platelet count stays up. What we call, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a it's a it's a, a a complete response off treatment. And probably what happened when your platelet count you you you're on the old trouble pack for three years, mm -hmm. the platelet count was stable, and then the fact that it was starting to go up probably meant that actually the ITP process, the destruction of your platelets was reducing and the platelets that you, you, you were producing yourself were staying in the body. And mm -hmm. that the and this itself may have brought on the sort of side effects of muscle pain and, and the aching you were getting. And so quite reasonable to stop and then see what happens. It's possible that the platelet count will come down again. We've got certainly had some patients who when we, we did the original studies ourselves on end plate and were the first group to show this, this long-term response off treatment, that some have remained with a long-term response for now several years without having had it. So it's a very interesting finding and one that uh, there, there's, there, I won't go into the details, but there, there are immunological reasons why a long-term increase in platelet count may damp down the destruction of platelets. So the three years of continuous response may well have improved issues. We saw the same thing, to be honest, in the 80s and 90s with, with the intravenous immunoglobulin. If you give patients regular intravenous immunoglobulin that keeps the count up, again, 30 to 40% would then maintain their treatment, which meant that we increased the intervals between giving the intravenous globulin because the count wasn't coming down as quickly. So any treatment that keeps the count up for a prolonged period may lead to that longer term response. So that's really quite exciting if you've got a count now that's pushing normal and as it remained at that level, then that, that's good. And particularly as, your, as the effects of the treatment, the side effects of the treatment on your body are gradually worn, worn out as well. And a, a lot of, certainly since lockdown, there's been an attempt to take a lot of people off who are off intravenous immunoglobulin to, to transfer it over to one of the thromboperitins. But for two main reasons. One is that the intravenous globulin is in fairly short supply. And B, it's actually now very expensive. And it's much more expensive to treat than, than, um, than, than the thromboperitins. And intravenous symglobulin is, is the only treatment for some neurological disorders. And so it's tended to be prioritized for those and only used in ITP for patients who need treatment acutely. And so although it can be used chronically for patients who don't respond to everything, anything else, it now in ITP tends to be reserved for those who need emergency treatment, I if you come in with a very low plate count and you're bleeding, you'll be given steroids and intravenous immunoglobulin. But it's not used to the same degree now for maintenance treatment in the way that you you were pre-lockdown. But that, that's really good if you've had that sort of sort of good response. Excellent. I never want that pain again. I felt like no. committing suicide. It was like I was being burned, and it wasn't all of them at one time. But it did one side one day, yes. another side another day. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is now. I, mean, I, I was going to make the point, the point earlier that that uh, uh, with um with Ma about the, uh, the the steroids and her diabetes that the proportion of patients who present with problems relating to the drugs they're taking is really very high. The instance of of side effects and medical problems relating to the treatment that that doctors give you is actually quite is actually quite high so the issue is to give treatment that's needed but not treatments unnecessary and to stop it when you can
Thank you. So yeah, there, there were some chats coming up, I think, from from William about his fatigue. I was just yeah, which I saw flashing. William up, was on Avatrombopec, uh, twenty milligrams every day. Oh yeah, uh, and his pain in his left side that he yes. says is an indication to him that his platelets are lowering, and lots of people say with you know with the fatigue levels rising. Mm. Uh, some people take that as a signal that their fatigue, that their platelets are dropping. Yes, I mean it. it, it it's interesting the the fatigue and and platelets, and I mean it's a very complicated association. But this was first picked up twenty odd years ago, and it was actually picked up by patients would come in and say to their doctor, "My platelet count's fallen because I've suddenly got very tired." And of course, in the past, I have to say, we used to say, well, actually, it's related to the steroids or the treat or or the treatment you're on or whatever. But actually, we realized it was consistent enough association to be related to the plate account being low, particularly if the plate account drops quickly, it can be associated with fatigue. Now, a lot of patients, but not all, when the plate account comes up, the fatigue disappears but not in everyone. No. And that's because the fatigue is probably associated to the both the production and the destruction of platelets within the bone marrow, which is associated with the release of substances that are related to fatigue. So if your platelet count goes up and the ITP process is damped down, then your fatigue will clear. If you're still destroying the patient platelets like crazy, and producing them like crazy. So you have a fairly reasonable count, but you've still got that underlying ITP process. You may still get fatigue. Not everyone does, but, but the majority do. I guess about a third get no fatigue at all. I mean, this is a rule of thumb. About a third have fatigue, which is quite marked and certainly affects quality of life. And about a third in the middle have some fatigue that doesn't really impact on life it's just there in the back room um so it, it's again like everything here it's a very complex association okay thank you Adrian. Uh, and, betty and as, you had a question so I, I was gonna say and anthony's put some things up there uh on on the chat and again i mentioned very briefly the article he he put on the in the platelet magazine in the september issue that that, that um there's also there's also things on the website, and there are there are some very good videos, and we've we've talked about this at the um at our uh, at our conventions as well, and a and a little push for for the convention in in Manchester next year. We've got a very good speaker coming to talk to us from the Netherlands on uh, on quality of life, which includes fatigue, but other things as well. You know, the long term effect of steroids and whatever, and um. And he will come, except that his son's getting married that month. Now, his son's supposed to be being married, I think, the following week. And he said if there's a problem with the dates, it could impact, but he hopes not. But he's a, he's a, got some fantastic data and is a really nice man, so, so he will come and talk about it. And we've also got a psychologist coming to talk who, who's talking about ways of dealing with chronic problems as well. And, and uh, so... That's that's my little plug for today. For yeah, and the, the tickets day. are available from our website, so you can <laughs> register now, please. Yeah, right. Uh, Betty, you're on mute still. So do you want to? No, you're still muted. I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah, Far away. Okay. On. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I've written it down. I'm going to ask. I'm on Avo Trombo Pack, Ava Trombo Pack. Uh, like the lady in this month's ITP magazine, my platelets vary a lot from five at one time to 264 another time. The dose is adjusted accordingly, but still varies. I am reluctant to go on immune suppressing medications because mm. although I had a replacement knee this year. My other knee is quite bad. So would being on immune suppressing drugs rule, 
rule out another new knee? And if I was on these drugs, how limiting would they be because of likely infections? Well, it, it, I mean, all, all immune suppressant drugs have some impact on, on infection risk. Um, it's only small, uh, but it, it is there. And the issue, I guess, is the degree to which your the platelets fluctuate, and a number of patients do have this sort of fluctuation. If they don't fluctuate to levels where you bleed and you otherwise don't have side effects, it's worth um, persevering. But what, what it's also worth doing is just, unless you are doing it already, is just to keep a little chart to see how your patient platelets fluctuate if they're going up and down, if there's any rhyme or reason relating to what time of the day you take the tablets or what what anything else that's happening. It's a good sort of association. You can look at the pattern of what's happening and say, well, are these regular fluctuations? Do you have something called cyclical ITP, I where the count goes just up and down irrespective of what you do? Or is this that sometimes you take the you take your treatment, the count goes up, comes down again, you take the treatment, the count goes up. That's more common with M plate. It's less common if you're taking treatment on a on a daily basis, but it still can occur. But um, uh, a, a low dose, the treatments are additive. I mean, what obviously Avatrombopag produces the platelets. It doesn't impact on the platelets being destroyed. And sometimes a, a smaller dose of, a, of an immune suppressant. So you're damping down the destruction process while keeping producing them. They may balance each other and keep the counts a little bit stable. Those don't need the very high doses of immune suppressants. And of course, in those, the infection risk is 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 very, very small. And it's certainly something that's worth discussing with the with the hematologist and saying, well, look, you're looking for knee surgery in the future. You're a little bit worried about that. What's the advice? And of course, he'll see your platelet counts as well, and we'll have a good idea about how your what your patterns patterns of response are and what the benefits of adding in other treatments and can can weigh up the potential infection risks. So it's worth discussing with your hematologist whether the fluctuations you've got are just worth persevering with and staying on the treatment you've got and whether it's necessary to add anything else in because of this potential surgery in the future that you're that you're expecting. Does that help, Betty? Uh, yes. Um, are there things that can, uh, you know, things that you eat, can that alter your count? Not no? really, no, no. Okay. We've we've looked at this extensively on and off over, over the years, and we've never found, I mean, occasionally you'll find the odd form of tablet that people react to or have some sort of allergy to that can affect it. But in general... Diet itself doesn't have a great impact. I mean, the, the, that that being said, some of you may have heard of the term the microbiome, which is the all the bugs in the guts. Now, there's there's this suggestion that your microbiome, because it it's it's part of your body's sort of immune defenses, may impact on the platelet count. But that's complete speculation. There's no work being done on it. And it's and it's it's actually quite a trendy concept at the moment. So I'm not saying all I know is that when diet has been looked at, the only advice is you need to have a good mixed diet so you get your veg plus your iron plus all the other things that we know are important for the building blocks of blood. But there is nothing specific that will knock your count down unless you have allergies. Um, and but but that that that's not a constant association anyway. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Anthony. You had your hand up before Rhonda, so go on. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mervyn. It's just I saw uh, something in the chat from David, and oh, I can just probably give say some, that one. Yeah, yeah, it, it kind of touches on all the three treatments that I've had. Funny enough, I started on uh, prednisolone when I was first diagnosed eighteen years ago, uh, and yes, it is very very. Uh, impactful on, on sleep patterns uh, and although I responded very well to steroids every time I had them um, it was not going to be a long-term solution for me so then I had rituximab 
in 2010 and also then again in 2013. Both occasions I responded well, uh, pretty quickly too, within about 10 days. Um, and after the second round of Rituximab in 2013, I, I, unfortunately I dropped again. So I got about two and a half years remission from both rounds of Rituximab. It was then that we uh, switched me on to mycophenolate in, um, where were we, 20... Oh, crumbs. It's uh, 2020, 2020, oh, uh, sorry, 2016 uh, that we went on to rituximab. So I've had a good, uh, sorry, off of rituximab onto mycophenolate. So I've had a good spell on mycophenolate and no issues at all. Normal plate that count, um, mm. apart from the odd dip here and there with colds and that sort of thing. But um, it's very difficult because you, when you're switching treatments, you have this potential to sort of chase the plate that count yeah um, yeah and you you have to be very careful not to overreact too quickly yeah. certainly with rituximab it, it can take quite a long time for your plate that count to to uh to come up um mm. i was lucky in that it happened within 10 days on both occasions uh but some people can go two months even possibly three months i understand before they'll see a, 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 an increase in plate that count yeah. from rituximab um, and, and I think my case was fairly typical that two and a half years remission seems to be um, pretty good from rituximab, mm. uh, although some people have had a, a great deal longer. So mm. I've had all three of those treatments, David, and, and um, you know, I responded well to all of them. But mm. mycophenolate for me seems to have, uh, have solved uh, my issue. But uh, if you want, to, I'll put my um, email address down later on. If you want to email me, I can get back to you if you if you want any sort of more detailed um i mean it's it's an interesting okay, bit it's an interesting point that that certainly some of these immune suppressive drugs that are that to use a phrase gentle i mean they're not, they're, none of them are gentle but some are no. some are more tolerable than others can take two to three months and certainly with things like azathioprine or mycophenolate we would not say it's failed until at least three months mm. and with the rituximab, again, some patients with rituximab have a very quick kick up, and then mm. it comes down and then drifts up again. But again, the early reports, which were you know, pretty much 15 plus years ago now, showed three phases of response. The early response, a sort of intermediate response after a couple of weeks, and then a response at least two to three months out. And it's all to do with it can take that amount of time to damp the immune process down. Mm. I mean, there are treatments that are used in some forms of, of therapy. I mean, if you give someone a, a kidney transplant or a bone marrow transplant, you want to damp the immune system down immediately so they get massive doses of treatment. That, of course, has severe side effects, which we don't want to see in ITP, which is why we try and give the immune suppression in a much more gentle way. Some patients respond very quickly. Others don't, and it depends on the strength of your autoimmune process. I mean, some autoantibodies that destroy platelets are very active, act very strongly, and only need to be around in small amounts. So you've got to damp them down quite a lot to stop them destroying your platelets. And that may take two to three months in using that sort of continuous chronic treatment. Others where the autoantibody has less active what we call avid it's less avid it doesn't grab the platelets quite so vigorously only has to be damped down a bit and the platelet count mm. comes up quickly i just noticed in the chat that ali has mentioned this app florio to track meds mm. and platelets i see, do you use that ali to check keep an eye on your own process yes i, I do that i i think i when i first joined the association i and one of the issues I saw it and downloaded it. To be fair, yeah. it's, it's been amazing. Yeah, yeah that uh, was in the Mar in the December last year. Yeah, uh, we, we said it was on its way, and then we, we actually launched it in March. Yeah. Um, there's another advert coming up for this December's edition as well because I'm I, I'm actually helping the Florio people to actually um, you know, try and get the word out if you like around the yeah. UK. Because mm. uh, uh, we've had a good take up in the first year. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say you have to use it, but I, I wouldn't say you have to use it. But I would say, as a clinician, 
if a patient comes to see me, and particularly if they've had a difficult problem, I mean, it's all right if you respond and it's all okay, but if you've had a difficult problem or you're changing treatments, it's really helpful to have that sort of graphic visualization of what's happening to your platelets along with the treatment when you actually see someone. It gives a really nice way of, of assessing it rather than saying, oh, it did this, yeah, and what, what treatment you were taking then? And now, oh, we, oh, I, and so, so it's a, it's it's great. So thanks for reminding of that, Ali. It's it's good. It's good. But yeah, a really good app. Really good app. Mm. All right, Rhonda, you got your hand up. Right, a few things. Um, first of all, on the microbiome, there is a research project, and I think it's one where they want lots of money from you. But that's Zoe, Z O E. Don't ask me what it stands for. I don't. I don't remember. But that is about the microbiome, and they do tests and things, which of course you have to pay a lot of money for. A lot of money. But I think that if you look at their stuff and have a, an idea about what it's all about. And I heard um, a program on Radio 4, which, of course, they're always factual programs and they've always had scientific advice and so on. And it was saying that the, the next big thing in health and treatment and organising what's wrong with patients and so on will be to do with the microbiome, but it's not going to come on board for quite a while. Right, so that's that one. The second one is to ask Adrian... Um, on my latest platelet count, I had a high platelet count, which said it was abnormally high. It was in the high 400s. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's come back to me and said, hey, we think there's something wrong with you. So, I mean, I'm not panicking about it. But, <clears throat> but I would like to ask you, excuse me, <coughs> at what number would you be concerned if it's going too high? Probably above about 450. If oh, well, progressing... mine is above 450. <laughs> well, and again, these, although all the machines where you do these are quality controlled, the first advice in any test, unless it's wildly abnormal, is to repeat it. Yeah. Because of, um, again, I have had it, I have had it 850 before. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, we, we get a bit alarmed there. That's why with the, with the, treatments with the thrombopoietins we try and maintain a level between 50 and 150 yeah um and again if it's consistently high you you want to know why yeah. are you bleeding is there something else going on anything going on in the body an infection a grumbling infection or any problem a little bit of bleeding the platelet count mm -hmm. goes up it may just be part of the normal process after all a normal range is only a statistical thing it's the average with sort of three standard deviations, for those of you who understand stats. So you can have a count that's outside, above or below the normal range, and it's still normal. Yeah. Um, and so it's really a question of seeing, is there anything going on? Is it, A, is it consistent? Has it been, is it normal? Is it changing? Is it slowly going up, slowly coming down? It's the same, or... Is it fluctuating and what happens over two or three readings? So oh. my advice would be get it checked again in a month's time and then see what the pattern is. Yeah, okay. And related to that, if I may ask you, um, now just give a tiny bit of background to this. There is a book that's been written by Ian McEwan called The Children Act. And actually the film was on television on BBC. You can get it on iPlayer if you're interested in that sort of thing. It's a bit about medical stuff. And the guy in the courtroom, the doctor in the courtroom, said that the platelet count should be 150. I just wondered, Adrian, if you were asked in a courtroom what the platelet count should be at least, what would you say? I'd say it depends. I'd say, <laughs> there, is, I'd say there is a range for the platelet count, which we normally expect to see but it depends on the context of the question. And any question, any plate count above 50 or 70, I would say is particularly normal and I don't worry about it. A count of 
450 or 400, I'm not particularly worried about that either, unless it shows a progressive change. Yeah, this was in a patient who had leukemia, and they said that if he didn't have a platelet count of 150, he'd die. Um, to use a term. <laughs> I thought so too. That's why I wanted yeah. to ask you, but I wanted yeah. to, to prove that I was right rather yeah. than, you know, guessing <laughs> it. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. You can you can scrub that comment on the recording. That's priceless, Adrian. In, in <laughs> case I in case I get accused of being being non non medical. No, no, and... don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? <laughs> no. Well, just just a few things, just to. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mervyn. Can I just come in? Of course, Sue. Sorry, yeah. Um, it's coming up for that time of year when I'm due to have um my next COVID vaccination and yes. flu vaccination, and is there any reason to be concerned about that? I'm actually in remission from um ITP at the moment. My last count was over a hundred. Mm. Um, I mean, my advice always is have the immunizations mm. because the chance of having a problem with a low platelet count if you catch the infection are much, much greater than the impact of, of the immunization on the platelet count. Um the 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 it was with both of the with the common inject in, inject injections and immunizations the risk of a low platelet count was something like 15 per million so it's quite small and what we found when we when we surveyed patients with itp it was a very small number had a low platelet count very small an equally small number had a had a platelet count that went up with the immunization and if you had one if you had a problem with one injection one immunization the fact of that occurring again with the next one is very low you couldn't say well i had a problem with that one i'm going to get it again with that because you can't predict it in that way so all i would say is that the risks of a low plate account and severe side effects with covid are much much higher than the risks from the from the immunization itself i mean the risks of a low plate account in covid is something like a third so I would certainly recommend, and particularly if your count is normal, I would certainly recommend. And what we did see in again in patients whose counts came down with the with the immunization is that it was in general transient and they went up again without treatment. Only a very small number required a dose of steroids to kick the count up. And uh, and certainly those sort of risks um were so small, they far the, the the risks of COVID itself far outweighed any potential risks with the immunization. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Sue. Thank you. Right. Um, just to let everyone know as well, all of the recordings from the talks from our uh, 2024 patient convention that was held in London back in May are now available on our YouTube channel, all of them, which is excellent. Um, We've got a couple of meetings coming up next week uh, in London. We've got on the 24th, um, I'm helping Professor Nikki Cooper organise a ITP update day at Hammersmith. The details are on our website. And also, which is very exciting, on the following day at the 25th, um, we've got the foyer at Hammersmith Hospital for uh, uh, ITP day, if you like, you know, um, uh, I'm taking loads of leaflets and, you know, uh, goodies up there and uh, 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 Nick is going to have her team there with posters, etc. So, like, uh, we will be in the foyer at Hammersmith Hospital for about four or five hours, I believe it is, uh, during the day on uh, the following day on the 25th. So that, that's really good. And then... Uh, these have come more and more lately. Um, the new haematology team at City Hospital Nottingham, um, we are have asked me to help arrange a patient meeting at City Hospital in Nottingham. We're doing that in November. 
So, and I think we've already got about 30 or 40 people signed up for that one. So it's really good. And hopefully we can start rolling these out around the country. And I'm sure, so at one point we will be able to get to Edinburgh. I'd love to get to Edinburgh again. Right. So we need to speak to the team at Edinburgh Hospital. Okay. To, you know, to try and get something going there. But um, it's really good. And I just wish again, Dr. Catherine Baggett a speedy recovery from her mild concussion. Yeah. And thank you, Adrian, as well, for stepping in at the last minute. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. But excellent. Thank you. Well done. And I'll try and get all this posted up by tomorrow afternoon. Lovely. Thank Always pleased to bye help. Bye. Nice to talk to you all. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you Interesting much. discussions. Nice chat. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye. Stay well. Bye. Thank you.